episode 8 of Law and Batting Order. I'm your host, Tony Iliacostas. Here are some quick hits from the past week. Super Bowl 46 ended with a giant victory for Big Blue. The Giants beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl once again 21-17. The Giants trailed New England 17-15 in the fourth quarter with three minutes remaining when Giants quarterback Eli Manning threw a beautiful pass to wide receiver Mario Manningham who caught the ball in bounds and kept the Giants alive. It wasn't a David Tyree-esque catch, but it proved to be crucial as the Giants continued their successful drive and running back Ahmad Bradshaw scored a touchdown with 57 seconds remaining. Those 57 seconds were not enough for Tom Brady to lead his team to a victory as the Giants left Indy with their fourth Super Bowl victory in franchise history. NBA fans around the world are thanking David Stern profusely because it's weeks like this past one that make basketball worth watching. On Monday night against the Sixers, Lakers guard Kobe Bryant passed former Lakers center Shaquille O'Neal on the all-time NBA scoring list, putting Kobe fifth on the list behind Wilt Chamberlain, Karl Malone, Michael Jordan, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Then on Tuesday night versus the Bobcats, Celtics star Paul Pierce passed Celtics legend Larry Bird as the second leading scorer in Celtics history. But the biggest story this week is Lincredible. New York Knicks point guard Jeremy Lin has lit up the scene in the Big Apple and has instantly become a fan favorite as he has scored 20 plus points in five consecutive games and has led the Knicks to five straight wins. His biggest game was against the Lakers on Friday night as he scored 38 points and had seven assists. Lin's presence in the backcourt has created a winning culture for the Knickerbockers and hopefully he'll be a thriving element for many more weeks and seasons to come. The Big East has officially gotten bigger. On Wednesday, the Memphis Tigers accepted an invitation to join the Big East Conference in 2013. The Big East Conference houses some of the biggest athletic departments in the NCAA, including Seton Hall, Rutgers, St. John's, and Louisville. Memphis's football and basketball squads will be competing in this conference, and the hope is that their presence in the Big East will make this conference one of the most competitive in the country. Today's Order in the Court will pick up where we left off last week regarding the recent NFL concussion lawsuit that 300 former NFL players are filing against the NFL. I discussed how these players could claim that the NFL acted negligently in response to the concussions that these players faced in their later years. If you haven't seen that video, you can click the annotation to my left or you can click the link below this video. Based on the prima facie of negligence, the plaintiffs could successfully prove that the NFL acted negligently. However, the NFL could raise a series of defenses that could shoot down the player's argument. The issue in today's video is, what defenses could the NFL raise to quash the plaintiff's claims of negligence? The first defense that the NFL could raise is an assumption of risk defense. Assumption of risk simply means that the plaintiff or injured party was aware of a risk associated with a particular activity and that risk was foreseeable but participated in that activity anyway. The case of Murphy v. Steeplechase Amusement highlights this rule of assumption of risk. The case dealt with the plaintiff who attended the defendant's amusement park and was waiting online to go on the ride called the Flopper. The ride involved people falling and the plaintiff was well aware of people falling while riding it. Nevertheless, the plaintiff went on the ride, suffered injury, and sued the defendant for negligence. However, the court held that the plaintiff assumed the risk. Based on the name of the ride and what he saw while he was waiting to go on the ride, it was reasonably foreseeable that he would fall and perhaps suffer an injury. He nevertheless ignored that risk and still rode the flopper. With the case of the former players suing the NFL, the NFL could raise a valid assumption of risk defense. Attorneys for the NFL could argue that it was reasonably foreseeable that helmet-to-helmet contact is commonplace in a physical and rigorous sport like football. It was also foreseeable that suffering a head injury is part of the game and there is the likelihood that a player could suffer a concussion if contact to the head was harsher than usual. In other words, concussions are an inherent part of football. The NFL could argue that while this risk existed, these players still assumed the risk with the hope that they could avoid such injuries. However, this wasn't the case. These 300 former players who suffered post-concussion symptoms in their later life in fact assumed the risk of suffering such an injury when they decided to willingly and knowingly pursue a career in professional football. While assumption of risk is one defense that the NFL could raise, another defense that could shoot down the plaintiff's claims of negligence is joint and several liability. 
the common law has adopted the rule that when two parties acting together commit an illegal or wrongful act, the party who is held responsible for the act cannot have indemnity or contribution from the other because both are equally culpable and the damage results from their joint offense. In other words, when there are two or more tortfeasors and both of their actions cause the plaintiff's injury, both tortfeasors should be held jointly and severally liable. Based on this rule of joint and several liability, the NFL can bring this as a possible defense to mitigate liability. Attorneys for the NFL could contend that while they are liable to a certain extent for failing to provide the players proper medical treatment after suffering a concussion, they could argue that they shouldn't be held fully liable. They could argue that the helmet manufacturers should be held equally liable. After all, it is very likely that the helmet companies fail to create safe and secure helmets that would ensure players enough protection from hard helmet contact that could result in a concussion. If this defense stands, then the NFL would assume liability of less than 100% and would essentially argue that the helmet manufacturers are intervening causes of the plaintiff's injuries. It all depends on how liable the court finds the NFL and the helmet manufacturers for the plaintiff's injuries. While both the plaintiffs and defendants present strong arguments, it seems inconclusive as to who will win this case. Nevertheless, this will be an interesting case to follow and it will be especially important as the NFL continues to regulate and monitor concussion treatment. That's the show. Leave all your comments down below and be sure to visit Law & Batting Order at lawandbattingorder.com as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, have a great week, guys.